Hello, and thanks for joining me on a glorious mystery growing up spiritually. Today is the first of a series of three talks on the foundations of this process. We're going to explore what happens to us as adults. Do we undergo changes? Do we think about things differently? How does this affect our faith and our faith development, our image of God, and so on? Today, we're going to talk about the basics. In the parts two and three, we'll dig a little bit deeper about how we think as adults and exactly what goes on in faith development, that journey that we go through in adulthood. So bear with me just a second while I share a screen, and we'll start the talk today. So as I mentioned, today we're gonna to focus on the foundations, the basic building blocks, the questions that we encounter as individuals and what makes the journey across adulthood so interesting and fascinating. So let's start with a few things that we can think about. Have you ever experienced changes in your concept of God over time? Maybe from the time you were in grade school to now or as an adolescent, or maybe earlier in your time as an adult. How is your image of God different? How has it changed? Have you changed your personal priorities over the years? Are things that used to be important not so important anymore? Are new things important that weren't before? Have you found that you think differently about what your life means? now than when you were younger. Maybe you get thinking about your legacy, how you want to be remembered. What gives you purpose? Maybe how that's different than it was 10, 20 years ago. If you've had any of those experiences, then you've experienced the development in adulthood. And luckily, you're in the right place. So let's dive in. Today, as we're gonna focus on the foundations, we're gonna start with the big questions that we ask ourselves as humans. We're gonna take a look at what our faith tradition says about adulthood and growing old. We're gonna look at a couple of things that, that kind of get to us, like when something's just nagging at you or you have doubt about something and why that's so very important. We'll take a look at this thing called the adventure of adulthood and how our image of adulthood and our understanding of adulthood has changed. We're going to pick up some GPS coordinates. You've all used GPS maps and everything in your car or on your phone. We're going to pick up the ones that are going to help us across adulthood. We're going to take a sneak peek at the long-term outcome of our talks. We'll take a quick look at where we're headed in terms of faith development in adulthood. Then I'm going to suggest that maybe St. Paul was onto something when he talked about the journey of adulthood in his letter to the Corinthians. Then we're going to get serious about what scientists and scholars and researchers have started to understand about the mystery of adulthood and the trajectory that we go on. And we're going to end today's talk with a look at the basic underpinnings, genetics, and what happens in our brains. And then we'll take a peek at what's going to be coming in part two. So here we go. As human beings, we have a tendency to ask ourselves six what are called big questions. Who am I really? What is the meaning of my life? What values drive me? Where am I in my faith journey? What is or will be my legacy? And what comes next? Each of these are uniquely human questions. They drive us through our lives. 
These are questions that we will grapple with at the very end. In fact, some people call these the questions that comprise the last things, the things that we wanna make sure that we get right before we die. And as we're gonna find out, these are the key questions that we bring with us that give us mileposts, mile markers, as we go through the journey of adulthood. So let's start with what we know about our faith tradition and what it says about adulthood. So let's start with what does the Bible say about older adults? Well, think about the biblical image of old age. In the Old Testament, there are a number of famous characters, Adam, Methuselah, Abraham, who are said to have been hundreds of years old when they died. Well, that's the Bible's way of raising up old people to say that old age is a great gift. The Bible often refers to old people with the image of gray hair. Interestingly enough, the Bible doesn't talk too much about baldness or any of the things that we kind of laugh about. But when they do talk about people with gray hair, they're talking about that as an image of the wisdom that comes with old age. So overall, the Old Testament gives a positive view about what happens and recognizes the changes occur because hair doesn't start out as gray as we get older. The Bible also talks about philosophical aspects and really talks a great deal about wisdom. In fact, that there are a number of wisdom books in the Old Testament. As I mentioned a little bit earlier, the Bible associates age with wisdom. Wise people are always portrayed as older. That wisdom comes with longevity and the experience that we get from living. Governments were often gerontocracies or, or um, run by elders. The Bible refers a lot to the elders of the tribe, or even in the New Testament, we hear about elders and scribes and Pharisees. It was the older people who were looked up to and thought wise enough and experienced enough to run things. Interestingly enough, even the US Constitution has age requirements for members of Congress and for the president. Each step up meant you needed to be older in order to be able or eligible to run. For example, in the Constitution, it says one has to be 35 to run for president. Because when in 1787, when they did the Constitution, 35 was considered fairly middle-aged. We don't look at it that way anymore. But it's an idea that even the framers of the Constitution thought that you needed to have a certain level of experience in order to run a government. And as I mentioned earlier, the wisdom books of the Bible were a way to, um, to get across in what I'm calling the intergenerational transfer of knowledge, to pass on the accumulated wisdom of living from one generation to the next. So take a look at books like Wisdom, Ecclesiastes, and so on, and look at the, the words of wisdom. We even use a lot of those sayings today as a way to, to pass on what each generation has come to know and want to pass that on to the next generation. The Bible also has a lot of social teachings, and, and since then, in our own faith tradition action related to age. We even have a commandment, honor thy father and thy mother as a way to show respect to people who are older than you are. There's a great deal of discussion in the Bible about being kind to, to older people because of the frailties. In the Old Testament and the New Testament, we're, we're told to be kind to older people when their minds fail. So there was a recognition that sometimes it's not a positive development only in older, in older age. More recently, in many of our own social teachings, um, recent letters from Pope Francis, 
There's an emphasis on the need for social services, new models of care as we get older, the need for intergenerational or multi-generational discussions. A very recent letter from the Vatican emphasizes the importance of intergenerational households in the pandemic. And the, the idea that one generation cares for the other um, and that intergenerational transfer of knowledge and wisdom is absolutely essential. So as we can see, our faith tradition, the Bible, our Catholic teachings are full of understandings that something is going on in adulthood that we need to pay attention to and honor. There's also a funny thing that happens. It's internal. It's a motivation. It's an urging that comes back at us from time to time. And I'm going to call that nagging and doubt. So if we think of adulthood um, as, as a cycle or a spiral cycle that goes back and forth between times of comfort and times when we're not so sure of things, we have a sense that something's not quite right, that we're not so sure about what we used to think we knew. So I'm going to call the, the, these times of comfort, times of stability. Things are pretty much okay. We're comfortable with where we are. We're not questioning a lot. But then every so often we get a, a little tug. We are not quite as certain about things. We hear or we learn new things that don't quite fit with what we know. And we're not quite sure what to do with that. So as we'll see, as we go across today's talk and the next two, that these forces, these processes of nagging and doubt are really the key motivators as we go through adulthood. They help us write our life stories. And they're the things that tug at us as we ask those big questions, particularly as we get closer to the end of our lives, those last things that I spoke of earlier. So tuck these away. We're gonna come back to nagging and doubt as key motivators quite a lot over this in the next couple of talks. So now we're ready to, to start on what I'm gonna call the adventure of adulthood. It's pretty interesting that for most of human history, merely reaching adulthood was difficult. Infinite child mortality was very, very high. Average life expectancy in biblical times was maybe 30 or 35. Average life expectancy, even at the beginning of the, of the 20th century, was 50, 55, because people died of all kinds of diseases that we now easily. Women died very often in childbirth. That was a very dangerous activity. So the whole concept that the majority of people reach old age is relatively recent. In earlier times, the consensus view was positive growth kind of ended at adolescence and everything from there was downhill. That kind of is still there Visit the local Hallmark store and look at the cards that kind of talk about you're over the hill when you hit 40. Um, things are downhill. Uh, you know, people are kind of forgetful in a bad way and things of that sort. And that wisdom was simply a byproduct of time. That started to change after World War, World War II. The attitude about adulthood and what happened and the trajectory changed dramatically in the 1940s and 1950s as people for the very first time started to do research on people of that age. Now we understand based on thousands of studies that human development continues in a positive direction well into late life and that this has turned adulthood into the journey of adventure. So with that in mind, let's collect the G some GPS coordinates. I've mapped the five stages or, or, or phases of adulthood that are generally accepted by researchers and scholars in adult development and aging. And I've kind of attached the current set of generations to them to give you an idea where they are along this line. 
So on the left-hand side of the slide, we have a period that's called emerging adulthood. That's the period, generally speaking, when people are in their 20s. And currently, we're talking about Gen Z, the front edge of that, and the youngest of the millennials. After we go through the emerging adulthood, we move into what's called established adulthood, where people are starting to settle down, uh, people start thinking and having families, settling into careers and so on. And this right now in their 30s and early 40s is solidly the millennial generation. The first wave of the millennials turned 40 this year. Um, we still sometimes hear about millennials as if they're still in their 20s, but they're not, except for the, the tail end of that generation. So these are people who are settling down and, and becoming established in everything. From there, we head into middle age, populated currently by the Gen Xers. And this is a period from about 45 or the early 40s to age 60. From there, we enter into what we, what we call the young old phase, roughly 60 to 75 solidly occupied at the present time by the majority of the baby boomers. And from there, the last of the segments of, of adulthood termed old, old, which is the, the group over 75 populated by the oldest baby boomers, the front edge of, the, of that generation just reaching that age now. We have uh, the silent generation and the remaining greatest generation. And the greatest generation are the ones who are the World War II veteran um, generation. There are three key points that I'd like you to think about um, from that stair-step slide. Each generation experiences inflection points when things change. When you go from emerging adulthood to established adulthood, or from established adulthood to middle age, things change. And we're gonna focus on what those are over the, the course of, the, of these talks. Each generation reflects certain universal principles about development. We're gonna be focusing mostly on what these are. There are certain things that happen irrespective of what generation you're in when you hit certain points in adulthood. Some common ones are every generation questions and rejects authority at some point. Every generation goes through changing priorities as they go from established adulthood through late life or old, old. By the same token, each generation has certain unique or defining characteristics that get talked about in the media all the time. In the scholarly research, we refer to these as cohort effects because each generation is kind of seen as a cohort. So these unique defining characteristics are things like the kinds of technology that people grow up with, the kind of music they commonly listen to, the slang or the language that people use to talk about, what sources of reliable information they use, and so on. So these are the things that kind of define a generation from a media point of view, but they are the things that don't tend to transfer much from generation to generation. So we're gonna pay a little bit less of attention to these. So I just wanted to separate out the universal principles, which actually define the drivers of human development from those things that give labels to each generation. Finally, I wanna come back to this notion um, because it's only about 60 years that we've been paying a great deal of attention to the change of adulthood, why that matters. A focus on change matters because Adulthood then becomes seen as a time of potential and growth, not just plateau and decline. That plateau and decline is a very negative model. Certainly it, de it describes some people's trajectories, but not the majority by any means. The attributes described in, in scripture, that notion of wisdom, positive aspects, the notion that we can't write older people off and ignore them become the norm. So interestingly enough, 
script, the writers of scripture had insights that it took us a long time to relearn. It's also the case that explanations of behavioral and attitudinal differences become possible and essential. We can't just say, wow, well, well, you know, that's just the way old people are. No, we need to understand why and how do those things happen. And it also gives us an opportunity to facilitate growth, to support people's change, not to turn the other way, but to open our arms and embrace it. So I wanna give you a preview of something that we're gonna be spending a lot of time on in the third talk, but to give you an understanding that we're all on a journey and all of the issues that we've talked about so far and will talk about all come together when we focus specifically on faith development on the third talk. So I'm gonna give you a preview of the first theory of, of faith development that was fully developed done by James Fowler. And I'm, these are the four stages in adulthood. There's one that starts kind of in late adolescence that he calls synthetic conventional faith. There's one that when we get into our 20s that he talks, he talks about individuative or reflective faith. He then says, you know, things change again once we get into our 30s and many people kind of stay there that he calls conjunctive faith. And the ultimate sort of a big picture faith that he talks about, universalizing faith, he says happens in late life for some people Many people never get there. So what I wanna give you is a taste that this notion of change, this notion of positive growth does in fact happen and is in fact studied quite a lot, specifically in faith development. And now we're gonna start talking about what are the underpinnings? What are the core foundational elements that allow us to understand why things like Fowler's theory could be developed, how this, these notions of faith and our understandings of faith can, can change, and what is it that gives us the ability to think differently and conceive of our faith differently as we go from late adolescence to late life? Here we go. As I mentioned earlier, you know, in a way, the people who wrote the scriptures really had an insight. So I want to point you specifically to Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 13, verse 11. In that verse, this is right after Paul's famous definition of love, he talks about how when he was a child, he thought like a child and he saw the world like a child. But as he became an adult, he put an end to his childish ways and thought like an adult. He thought differently. That important insight by Paul is a way that we can start to unravel the stereotypes of aging because those stereotypes stifled our ability to see and understand the real changes. What exactly was it that Paul sensed? What are those changes that Paul talks about that he put an end to his childish ways and took on the ways of an adult? What are those ways? How do they happen? How do those changes that Paul talked about come about? Our understandings of that largely have all come since the mid 20th century. And they are the result of some of the most exciting research and some of the most intriguing, interesting discoveries about how the brain is wired, how people use those new connections, the way we think about things, that you're gonna find in all of science.
So we're going to start by framing this journey of adulthood. What exactly is going on? We're going to spend a little time um, today on what I'm calling the neurobiophysiological forces, that underlying hardware. We're going to focus mostly on genetics, our gene structure, the building blocks, and brain and physiology. Okay? We're going to talk about how the brain changes, how it's put together, how the different parts of the brain are connected, the neurotransmitters, those chemicals that help the brain function, hormones that um, come into play, um, physiological changes that go on. Um, I'll talk through how those brain changes matter and how they underlie what we'll consider in the, in the second talk, the ways we think and so on. We're going to talk about the type, uh, some, you know, I'll mention some types of life expectancy. We have what's called chronological life expectancy. That's when we talk about the average life expectancy at birth, which right now is about 78 to 80. We, we can talk about functional life expectancy, how long your life expectancy is when you've got good health and, and so on and so forth. We'll bump into that from time to time as we go on. Um, in our second talk, we're going to focus mostly on the psychological forces, what I'm calling the software or the apps. We're going to focus a lot on the underlying cognitive processes and stages of cognitive development. These are the descriptions of the ways in which we think. How do we approach a problem? How do we understand the world? How do we take things into account? How do we add pieces of information that aren't obvious in a problem. When do we do that? When do we not do that? How do we decide what hill it is that we're going to die, that we're going to be willing to die on? And we're going to consider some theories by a number of people and talk about the stages and the processes that we go through in adulthood in terms of how our ways of thinking become more complicated, how we're able to hold multiple um, ideas, multiple possible solutions in our head at the same time. And how is it that we sort through this massive amount of information that we're confronted with every day of our lives and make sense out of it? We're also going to consider changes in the personality and emotional processes that we have in adulthood. We're going to look at things like personality traits how they change over time, things like introversion, extroversion, how open are we to new experiences, um, how agreeable we are over time, and so on. And look at the research that shows that some of those change fairly easily and others don't. We're going to look at the ways in which we tell our story how our autobiography or our life story evolves over time, how certain kinds of ideas creep into that telling, how we just drop certain ways of looking at ourselves, how we add things and how we can come back to those big questions from time to time, how we change things like uh, our legacy that I mentioned earlier, how all of that comes together and enters into the answers that we give to people when people say, so tell me a little about yourself. How we do that self-presentation and how that evolves over time. We're going to consider how those things come together in social processes, how it is possible that we can change our mind or how we change other people's minds. We're going to look at um, how our ability to think and the complexities and, that we're able to deal with combine with how we think about ourselves in those life stories, how those come together and give us an opportunity to sort through and come to conclusions about our moral principles, how we decide what values we're going to hold how tightly we hold them, 
How is it that we interact with and understand or don't understand people who are different from us? How people who think differently from us, who hold different values from us? Are we able to process that? And if so, how is it that we're capable of doing that? Finally, we're gonna focus specifically on our faith and spiritual development as the concrete example of all of the biological genetic brain changes, how all of those softwares and apps come, to, come into play and how that unfolds across adulthood in our own understanding of our own faith, how our concept of God changes, how our un understanding of our interactions and the gospel message changes, how our understanding of what scripture says to us deepens and changes over time. And we're gonna take a look at that from a number of different points of view. We're gonna look at it from the point of view of the way that we construct our lives and take those changes that I spoke about earlier in terms of what matters to us and where we get our motivations and what is it that we're looking for in life and how that changes over time from the perspective of people like Thomas Merton and Richard Rohr. And we'll take a different look at it. Um, I gave you that preview of James Fowler's stage theory. We'll look at um, uh, other people's stage theories from a, a slightly different perspective. They sometimes will base it on the, the way that we can think about things. We'll consider people who highlight certain aspects of the lifespan. So we'll spend an entire session on how we use and experience all of these changes that we're gonna consider to deepen and really change our fundamental understanding of faith, God, Jesus's mission, um, and, and our understanding of the, the, the gospel message. So let's get, let's get specific. Let's start with the most fundamental building blocks in the journey of adulthood, our genes. We know that our genes provide the foundation or blueprint on which we are built. Our, in terms of adult development, we understand that our genes set the stage for how long we're gonna live, our lifespan, our susceptibility for certain diseases, and in certain cases, whether or not we're actually going to get that disease. It sets a baseline for our intellectual abilities, our physical abilities, and so on. As much as I might want to be, um, a fantastic basketball player or golfer, unless I have a basic genetic ability for those kinds of sports, I can take all the golf lessons in the world and I'm just not gonna get there. So what we're talking about here, as, as we'll, we'll get to, are potentials. Our genes provide tendencies, they don't provide the certainties. So let's talk a little bit about that. In terms of things that matter to us in, in adulthood, susceptibility to certain things like diseases, cancer, early onset, Alzheimer's disease, and so on, you've probably read about. We know that certain genes predispose us to those things. In certain cases, things like Huntington's disease, if you have uh, certain, those, those genes, in those cases, there's an absolute certainty. However, in other areas like traits, for example, we may have a predisposition to certain conditions, but our lifestyle and other factors in our environment and so on may help us stave off those diseases or may make it more likely that we get them. So the key message that we need to take away from this topic is that our genes are not necessarily our destiny. It's like the roughing in or the framing of a house. It sets 
maybe some boundary conditions or the basis on which we can build, it does not determine the ultimate outcome. Some genes have as their job, as it were, uh, an internal clock to turn certain processes on or off at specific times. And these play very key roles in human development. Probably the most well-known, most famous, if you will, genetic clock that we encounter in adulthood is the clock that starts the process in women of menopause. It's a genetic timer that turns on at a specific time so that certain physiological changes in women happen at that point. We have other clocks at other, point, other times in our lives. We have clocks that, that turn hair gray. Um, and so these are like timers that start or turn on genes that have been quiet for all of that period of our lives and it's now time for them to come into play. There are other genes that turn off other processes. So these genes act like switches, if you will. They, they operate at various points. There's a range um, in chronological time when they tend to operate, and that is, is their function. So in a sense, we have a lot of different kinds of genes that matter across adulthood, but again, I want to emphasize that second bullet. Genes are not necessarily our destiny. We have a lot of ability to influence their activity. So from genes, let's take it one step up and focus a little bit on the brain. Because there are, it turns out, really important changes in what happens in our brains. Now, we all know that we're born with all of the brain structures we are ever going to have. Those are all present at the time of our birth. What happens over time is the creation and the deletion of interconnections among specific brain structures. It's not that we generate new brain cells. It's not that we generate new parts of the brain. It's we are continuously tweaking how those structures are connected, how complicated those connections are. And as we see, we're, we're continuously pruning connections that we don't use or we don't need anymore. So there's always nurturing or tending the, uh, I'll call it the garden of the, of the brain to make sure that our brains will operate in the most effective and efficient ways possible. So the key thing here is that new and revised interconnections is what enables new ways of processing input and ways of thinking to happen. As we get older, these interconnections change. For most of our lives, we've got the ability to make them more complex and more numerous. And, a, and another important aspect of how our brains work is our brains are hardwired to work in the most efficient way possible. In the scientific literature, these are called heuristics or processing biases that are critical to achieve this. Here's what I mean by a heuristic or, or processing bias. As we practice something over and over and over and over again, we have to consciously think about it less. Remember when you were first learning how to drive a car? you had to think about all the little things that you needed to do, how to turn it on, how all of the gauges told you information, how hard to press the gas pedal, how hard to press the brake, if you learned on a manual transmission, what to do with the clutch, if you were stopped on a hill, which was 
the most horrible thing for most of us in learning how to drive a, a manual transmission, how much gas and, the, and to let off the clutch and so on and so forth. For most of us, when we were first learning how to drive a car, we had to so totally focus on everything. We couldn't talk to other people. We had the radio off and so on. But over time, as we got more and more practiced, we could talk to our parents or the driver's ed teacher who was sitting in the car. We could listen to the radio. Eventually we could sing the song on the radio. Eventually we could talk to everybody in the car. Eventually we could drive on a freeway for 10 miles and go, how did we get here? Because it has become so automatic. That's what I mean by a heuristic or a processing bias. We get so good or so used to this kind of experience or this kind of input that it drops out of consciousness and it goes on autopilot. If we were not able to do that, imagine never reaching that point in driving a car. Imagine if you were learning how to play tennis and you had to think about where to put your feet, where to put your, how far back to, to move your arm, to have to think of in your head, where is that ball going? And it never got any easier. You see quickly that that's the reason that the human brain is hardwired to be efficient and to create these biases. It's automatic. It's something that is deeply ingrained in, our, in the genetics underlying our brains and without which we simply could not function on a day-to-day -day basis. And we're gonna come back to the, this fact of heuristics and processing biases quite a lot because they become very, very important when we start talking about the ways in which we think because bias and heuristics have gotten a lot of conversation lately in terms of how we deal with other people. So we're gonna talk about not only is it hardwired as part of the, of the brain, but it's hardwired in how we think and how our thinking changes. And we'll figure out ways of workarounds and how to bring back these biases into consciousness. The last thing I'll say about these right now is that if you think back to anytime you learn something new, it's a lot of work. You are tired when you're done that activity. You were tired after your early lessons in, in tennis, not from just running around the court, but just thinking about it. You were tired at the end of your driving lessons because thinking at a conscious level is hard work. It takes a lot of energy. It's another reason we can't do it a lot. We can't do this all the time. So let me take a second and focus on a, a, a few brain structures that are critically important in terms of understanding how things change in adulthood. So here's a little map diagram of the human brain. It's a side view where on the right hand side of, of the picture, um, if you can see my cursor, it's this front part on the right hand side, that's the front of your head. And on the other side where the, the dark brown and, and is below part of the, the pink part. That's the back of your head. This is the, the, the rear um, bottom of, of your brain. And this is the, the back, of, uh, and above that is the back of your head. Where most of the action is that we're gonna focus on in adulthood is the very front, that part of your brain that's right behind your forehead called the prefrontal and frontal cortex. This the very front, right? Literally right behind your forehead. And the part that's kind of in the box in the center, in particular, the part that's kind of a reddish color that kind of wraps around um, in a, in, in, it almost looks like a stylized letter C. That structure is called the amygdala. 
Um, as we'll see, these two parts of the brain um, are greatly involved in changes in how they are connected. Um, and how those interconnections go, uh, go and change across adulthood underlie a great deal of the changes in the way we think. But if you, if you just remember that the part of the brain that we're, parts of the brain we're talking about is right behind the forehead and almost dead center in the middle of your brain. So what happens? <clears throat> well, it turns out that that area right behind your forehead, the prefrontal cortex, there's not a lot of action going on there until you're actually in your 20s. Because it's only in your mid to late 20s that the prefrontal cortex really turns on, literally, and becomes connected to other parts of the brain. This part of the brain, that part right behind your forehead, that prefrontal cortex, this is the center for the highest level thinking, the, your ability to solve the most complicated problems, your ability to, to think about the most complicated situations, the highest level of thinking. It's only after that part of the brain gets connected. That's part of the reason why before that, adolescents, children can't handle the complicated kinds of problems that adults can. That part of the brain in those individuals just simply isn't connected and isn't being used. In, the late, in your late 20s and 30s, not, now that the prefrontal cortex is active, that part of the brain, that prefrontal cortex, starts to get much more deeply connected with, that, with the amygdala that part of the brain that's in the, in the dead center. If you remember, I mentioned that the amygdala is, is connected with emotion. The prefrontal cortex is connected with thought. So it's in your late twenties and in your thirties that for the first time in your life, in a deeply fully integrated way, thinking and feeling become integrated that they become two sides of the same coin, that it becomes possible for you to fully integrate thinking and feeling. Prior to that, you certainly felt, had emotions. You could certainly think. You could think about emotions, but they weren't inextricably intertwined in the same way that they are for an adult. We'll talk about what that means in practice later, and we'll focus a lot on what that intertwining means in part, in part two. But for now, understand that it's not until you're in early and getting into established adulthood, if you remember those stair steps, that thinking and feeling become inextricably intertwined for the first time in your life. These new interconnections allow you to solve very complicated problems that may have an emotional component, for example, that's not entirely obvious, or maybe have a, a cognitive aspect or a thinking aspect that may not be perfectly obvious to someone for whom those two are not fully interconnected. This interconnection allows you to think about things in multiple layers at the same time. You, it's like the la layers of an onion. You can peel them apart and see them in ways that you couldn't before and understand the problems are very much more complicated than what they might seem to be. You might remember that when you were an adolescent, you, you thought that it's, this is a simple thing. And your parents would look at you and say, well, you know, it's a little bit more complicated than that. And you had a hard time understanding, you know, um, and it's one of the reasons that 
many times we, when we're adolescents, think that our parents aren't exactly the brightest people on earth. But later on, come to understand that maybe they weren't as out of it as what we thought. Because now we have a deeper understanding that they were seeing things that we were not capable of seeing. And it turns out that even later in life, when you're in your 60s and 70s, even more areas of that prefrontal cortex, that area of the brain right behind your forehead, are now being engaged and connected with the amygdala. <clears throat> and you now see even different patterns of interconnections if you look at people in their 60s and 70s on brain scans compared to when people are in their 30s and 40s. The areas of the brain that light up are more extensive when you're in your 60s and 70s than when you were 20 years younger. So the main takeaway here is that these brain interconnections allow you to see things and understand things at a level of depth and at a level of complexity that people before they're certainly their 20s and 30s are simply unable to understand. So it's only during adulthood that these parts of the brain that are involved in the highest orders of thinking begin functioning and get connected to the emotional centers. And that changes everything. It gives us the power to think and understand and feel differently. We can think about our feelings. We can feel about our thinking in fundamentally new ways. These new foundations provide the foundation and wiring that are absolutely necessary for us to think and understand in different ways. To answer those big questions in new and deeper ways, to understand the gospel message in new and deeper ways, to understand what seem to be paradoxes in Jesus's parables for the first time ever. We could even see how these changes um, are obvious in, in the ways that people react to and resolve or resolve problems. If we watch people over time um, and watch people across their lives, we might even notice how people react differently to seemingly similar problems. You remember one of the things I asked you early on is did you ever have the experience that you react to things differently now than you used to? It well could be an example of the new and, most, and more powerful interconnections that you are experiencing in your brain that allow you to see things that, yeah, there's more to it than, there, than I thought there was. Or, you know, in the grand scheme of things, this is not the most important or the most critical aspect of this problem. So let's pause now and take a minute and take a little peek ahead. And then we're gonna come back and pull all of the things that we talked about today together. In our next part, part two, we're gonna apply what we just talked about in terms of these new brain processes and reorganizations and how we're going to see them expressed in our personal beliefs, our values, we'll get a sense and an inkling as to how they play out in our faith, and how they play out in our behavior. And we're gonna to begin to explore how these developmental changes play out in our daily lives. We're gonna see how these changes that happen in our brains that allow us to see the world differently, can help us understand things like polarization, help us understand how people hold different points of view, how we reach points where we have a hard time understanding where people are coming from, why sometimes in adulthood it's easier to change our, our beliefs than others, how at some points in adulthood we see multiple right answers, where at other times we see one right answer. And how all of that helps deepen and change our, our faith 
our understanding of scripture, our understanding of the church's teachings, and how we live out our lives in our day-to-day -day existence. But first, here are some key takeaways that I, I hope that you think about from our, our talk today. First, adulthood is in fact a time of change and development. But even though we might take this for granted, <clears throat> This is a relatively recent understanding, about 60 years, 70 years old. It didn't used to be that way, but fortunately for us, it really is. Secondly, nagging and doubt are dry, the drivers of change in adulthood. We're gonna come back to this time and time again. These are the primary motivators for why and how we change. And we're gonna experience them. Third, development during adulthood happens, but not everywhere at once, not in every aspect of our lives at the same time. And it's not at the same rate all the time. It's not like a nice smooth process. It's in fits and starts. Sometimes it seems like change is happening really fast. And at other times it's, we're okay right now. We're content, we're in those, we're in those quiet times. There are common and unique aspects to every generation. We're gonna focus on the common ones, but keep in mind that the labels that we put to, gener to each generation, baby boomer, Gen X, millennials, Gen Z, are those unique things. Finally, our genes provide a foundation on which things are built, but are not the sole determinants of our destiny. Genes do not define us totally. And the key changes in the brain structures and how our brains are wired provide the hardware for all of the changes in thinking and behavior that we're going to consider. It really comes down to how those developmental changes in the connections have developed, that garden, tending that we do, the nurturing of new connections, the pruning of things we don't use. So before we move to part two, when you get a chance to watch that, I want you to think about how your answers to the big questions have changed over your own life. Or Think about how other people that you know have changed in the answers that they might give to these questions. That'll give you some insight into the developmental process. Remember the times in your life when you experienced nagging and doubt, those big motivators. What were the issues that, that caused this nagging or, or that you started wondering about what caused them? How did you feel at the time? How did you resolve it? What happened <clears throat> before the nagging and doubt started? What happened on the other side? And let your wonderings and curiosity come out and bring those to our next opportunity together in part two. In the meantime, if you have any questions about part one, or just have general questions about adulthood, things that might happen, things that you've read about, please feel free to send me those questions at my email address here at globaljcc at gmail.com. I wanna take this opportunity to really thank you again for taking the time to spend a little wondering and exploring and learning about the changes that happen in adulthood as we continue to understand that glorious mystery about spiritual development across adulthood. Thank you for being here. Be well, take care.